Hello and welcome to the 2022 edition of Words, London's Literary and Creative Arts Festival. I'm Joshua Lambier, the Artistic Director of Words, and I'm coming to you live from London, Ontario, to host one of our feature events of the festival this November. As we all gather today virtually, near and far across Canada and beyond, and I can see such a uh, national audience tuning in in the chat right now, um, I wanted to situate us in the territory on which this event is zooming to you uh, at home. I'm currently in University College at Western University, just up the hill from the banks of Deshkan Zibi, or Antler River, also known as the Thames River, on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapuak, and Chinoctin peoples. In the London area, there were Treaty 6 London Township, Treaty 7 Sombre Township, and Treaty 21 Longwoods, as well as the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous people whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and water and as vital contributors to our community and to the Words Festival. The river that flows nearby, just down the hill from where I'm located right now, is Deshkanzibi, and it connects us to local Indigenous communities, including Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. It's my privilege tonight to have the opportunity to host our distinguished guest, Guy Vanderhaeg, who will be joining us to talk about his new best-selling novel, August Into Winter, and here's the book. Everybody should go out and pick up the book. It's an epic story that immerses us in the world of Kanet in the late 1930s on the brink of the Second World War a small prairie town that has been experiencing a series of inexplicable break-ins and crimes that will escalate into a thrilling confrontation with violence, monsters in our communities, and the emergent presence of evil in the world. Immersed in the storm-tossed rural landscape of Saskatchewan with breathtaking attention to detail, the novel also wrestles with the question of loss, resilience, endurance, love, and redemption. The Words Festival is coming to you to the safety and comfort of you at home to bring the brightest writers who are tackling issues of pressing concern, making us laugh, commiserating with human sorrow, and confronting big ideas. At a time when our public debate is being mediated too often by 240 character volleys back and forth, we want to step out of that fray for a moment and have in-depth conversations with our authors, tarrying a while to focus our attention on their books. Over the next hour or so, we're going to engage with Guy's new book and his work. And we're going to take your questions in the chat and on the webinar's Q&A function. So send along your thoughts and questions and cogitations to join the discussion as we go along. I will be here to bring those questions out of the chat and the Q&A and ping pong them over to Guy. And I truly do mean that. Make sure as you come up with a question, throw that into the chat or the Q&A. It's a little easier for me to find if it's in the Q&A button. Uh, and we'd love to have everybody join the discussion as we go along. I would also like to recognize the generous support of the Ontario Arts Council, the London Arts Council, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at Western, financial supporters who allowed us, and get this, allowed us to keep the festival largely free during these last few years of our pandemical times. Um, that's been just a tremendous source of pride for me as a festival organizer that we were able to engage everyone with uh, free content as much as possible um, to join us from just about anywhere in Canada and beyond. Our distinguished guest tonight, Guy Vanderhaeg, is one of Canada's most celebrated writers. He is the author of six novels, four collections of short stories, and two plays. His very first collection of short stories, Man Descending, was a critical success, winning the Governor General's Award for Fiction and the Faber Prize. His first play, I Had a Job I Liked Once, received the Canadian Authors Association Award for Drama, and in 1996, his novel, The Englishman's Boy, won the Governor General's Award for Fiction. Guy's 
novel, The Last Crossing, won Canada Reads, or CBC Canada's Reads, championed by singer-songwriter Jim Cuddy. And his short story collection, Daddy Lennon and Other Stories, would eventually capture his third Governor General's Award. Guy has received both the Harborfront Literary Prize and the Timothy Finley Prize, given in recognition for an outstanding body of work. He has received many honors, including the Order of Canada and a fellowship at the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. I'm very honored to say that he is making his second appearance at the Words Festival, the first being our inaugural year in uh, 2014. Uh, Guy Vanderhaeg, welcome back to the Words Festival. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for that uh, very generous, perhaps too generous introduction, but uh, I will take generosity where, whenever I can get it. It's well deserved, very well deserved. So August into winter, uh, it marks a return to the historical novel uh, in your work. So I thought I would begin uh, with, I hope it's not too capacious a question, but uh, you'll, hopefully you can indulge me with a capacious question, but it's inspired by a talk that you gave at the Trudeau Foundation. And we first met for everybody at home. I met a Guy at the Trudeau Foundation when I was a scholar and Guy was a fellow. Uh, all the fellows who are part of the foundation during their time would offer a lecture on their work. Um, and Guy gave a brilliant talk called Apprehending the Past history versus the historical novel. And one of the questions you set out to wrestle with was, is the historical novel really an examination of the past or an oblique look at the present? And if I was listening to your lecture carefully enough, and correct me if I wasn't, uh, you argue that the historical novel is often about contemporary issues in disguise. I wonder if you could talk about how you came to write about this particular period, um, 19, the 1930s on the verge of war, and whether you had our own precarious moment in mind uh, when you set yourself to the task. Yes, I mean, um... Like the 1930s, I think we're living in politically dangerous times. And what happened in the 1930s was what I would call the erosion of the middle and the erosion of liberal democracy. So you had a very strong push to the radical right uh, towards fascism or Nazism or the kind of authoritarianism um, that was very close to fascism that appeared in places like Poland and Hungary. On the other hand, you had uh, a, a, a kind of a communist um, movement uh, that was embraced by intellectuals in the West um, as, as, a, as being what appeared to be the only the only thing that would stop the, the fascist menace. Um, so it felt, it feels to me and felt to me, and 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 I've been I've been I've been uneasy about this for a long time. I mean, even as early as 1996, um, in my novel uh, The Englishman's Boy, right. there's a movie producer who 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 has fascist tendencies, which is he's injecting into his films. And, and I'm, one of the interesting things is that radical politics, if it possibly can, or totalitarian politics, I should probably say more correctly, loves to take control of the visual media. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm giving a stumbling answer to this, but I think that many of the problems that, that the 1930s faced, we face now. Um, and though it's not to the same degree, we also face the possibility of war. Mm. What's, happening, what's happening in Ukraine right now bears very strong resemblances to what happened to Poland. Except that, except that Ukraine isn't tied into, in, in, into an alliance the way that the Poles were, right? You're, you're seeing a division, a political and military division between East and West that, that in many ways mirrored 
what, what was occurring in Europe. Now, any sort of historical analogy, obviously, is, can be picked apart because there are also significant differences. I think, I think what, what, what we are facing right now is, is a question about how resilient and how strong liberal democracy can be under these threats. And in some ways, I think that that's what I was writing about obliquely in August into winter. But again, in a historical novel, what you attempt to do is personalize these forces or these ideas in the lives of individuals so that they lose some of their abstract quality um, and, and that you see them working, working themselves out in people's lives the way we ourselves are trying to work out these problems in our lives. One of the things is, is that hindsight is almost always totally perfect. <laughs> but if you have um, characters in a particular moment who don't realize what the outcome of their actions or the historical forces that they're dealing with are going to be, they actually reflect our position now. I think that many of us, or at least I am, are stumbling around in the dark. Right. We don't actually know where we're headed. We may have premonitions, and those premonitions may be, may be bad premonitions, or in some cases, other people um, see sunny days uh, and sunny ways. But none of us knows. And I think that's like one of the things that a historical novel can do is, is suggest that we don't we, we arrive at an answer, whatever answers we arrive at by living through events. And I'm worried about the events we're living in. Absolutely, absolutely. And I wanna come back to some of the points that you've made um, when we dive into, into a discussion of, of the book. Um, but I do wanna, I also wanna ask you something about um, the essay that I'd mentioned previously. You talk in, in the essay about the historical novel being, uh, and this is a phrase that I love that uh, comes up in that essay, it's an awkward centaur at once history and fiction. And you made the fascinating remark that your novel, um, The Englishman's Boy, which you mentioned earlier, had an elephantine gestation period was the, the phrase that you used in the essay, because you had to negotiate between these two masters. On the one hand, fiction, and on the other hand, history. In the end, you came to the realization that the term historical novel, uh, of the two terms, the noun is of greater importance to the novelist than the adjective. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that discovery and how it up opened up a new horizons or new pathways for you as, as, a, as a writer of historical fiction. Yeah, I, I should probably explain that, that I had a brief uh, period as a graduate student in history, and that I actually did an MA in history, and then decided that I was not suited as an academic historian. But I had this residue about correctness <laughs> okay, uh, that, that lingered when whenever I turned to a historical subject. And I had to you know, when I use the phrase awkward centaur, aesthetically, the historical novel has has always been just often dismissed by people with highly artistic leanings, okay, as compromised and flawed. Right. And it it faces some of the same criticism from academic historians as not being correct. The thing that I, one of the other things that I think about the historical novel is not only is it about the present, <clears throat> it's also about what does history mean. Right. So in some ways, that engagement is embedded, I think, in the best historical novel. So if you look at Hilary Mantel and, and uh, her you know, brilliant three novels about Cromwell. If you look at them hard, at least I think, you can find all sorts of, of, of hints in them about the direction that the UK was taking, right. taking at the point of writing. 
everything from Brexit to how involved are you in Europe? How, how, uh, how, how do you construct national identity? Which were all sorts of things that both Henry VIII and Cromwell were juggling, right? Cromwell was a man who had lived in Italy, worked in the full uh, wool trade in the in the um, in Holland and Belgium and all those sorts of things. He was he was um, <clears throat> he was a man who knew what at that point in time was was the wider world as opposed to to many other English. On the other hand, he was trying he was trying to help negotiate what England would be in the future, mm. and. And I think Mantel was actually talking about what 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 will England be in the future? What is the direction it should go in? And there's no surprise that she wasn't an outspoken critic of, of Brexit, right? There's there's something anti-Brexit, and I, I, I again, I mean, she didn't say to her. I'm sure she didn't say to herself, "I'm going to sit down and write an anti-Brexit novel." Yeah, right? but. But your perspective of the world and the way the world is going, I think, emerges in your work if 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 you're a writer of fiction. And so sometimes, at least in my case, I only realize what I've what I've been doing after the fact. So sometimes when I talk about what I what I think a novel is about, it makes it sound as if I had a blueprint. <laughs> yes. Or a kind of fill in the dots. Um, paint by number set, and I knew exactly where I was going and what I was going to say, and what my characters were going to do to illustrate whatever ideas were embedded in, in the novel. But I think it goes in the opposite direction. Your characters and what you invest in them actually express, ex express ideas that are important to the novel. Absolutely. And one of the things that you remark about, upon in, in, in some ways, those abstract forces that are pushing us towards things like Brexit and some of those larger forces in the world, by leaning into the now novel, um, we arrive at something uh, that could be like intimacy. And you describe the intimacy of lived experience and the, the texture of life, I think, is a phrase that, uh, that you use as well. Could you talk about that importance of intimacy? For, for your writing? Well, the 19th century Italian historical novelist Manzoni, who ran into criticism from Goethe about, <laughs> about his Il Promesso, uh, I think he, he made an interesting observation, which may sound a little bit too simple, but he said, history tells us what people do. The historical novel um, uh, tells us how they felt about what they do. So that's the intimate part of history. When I talk about lived experience, I'm saying to myself, if I'm, if I'm writing a particular scene, I may ask myself, what would it have been like to be a member of the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion in Spain mm -hmm. in the 1930s, fighting the Spanish Civil War? And you, you are a committed communist, but you're beginning to see that things are not as pure or as cleanly or as, as uh, idealistic as you may have thought when you were sitting in Winnipeg. And I think that that's sort of like true of almost every, every character in the novel with maybe the exception of the deluded Ernie Sickert <laughs> that, what what they find is is that their ideas are tested by the world, um, and and what they what they feel is important is tested by by the world and and experience. Um, you know the 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 Canadian um, historian Donald Creighton made I, I thought a very interesting observation, wh where he said that. Um, History is character and circumstance. Right. Which basically means in given circumstances, what does a person of a certain character do in those circumstances opposed to a certain character of, 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 you know, who, who faces those, those same circumstances? 
So, I mean, at the simplest level, you could see, say, um, Winston Churchill did something very different than, than, than Chamberlain did, right? There were two men of different, different characters who were roughly facing the same kind of circumstances. Um, and the, the outcome of history, I, like, I, I don't want to make, I don't want, want to suggest like it's all personality, it's not right. you know, economic forces and all the rest of it. But, but, but certainly, it seems to me that that's part of how human beings make history and how, how human me beings decide about what kind of history they want to make. You know, you could say the United States or any political entity that Donald Trump wants to tell a different story than Joseph Biden does. And part of the story that they tell are a product of their upbringing, their background, but it's also, it's also part of their personality and character. Right. And that's a really fascinating way to um, get to one of the things that I admire about your work is the humanity of the characters and the fact that history doesn't feel like an overwhelming force, even though there are super, super structural questions, you do feel like the characters have agency, that they're able to make choices. Um, one of the things uh, to set the stage for the discussion, and I'm going to dive into the, the book in a minute, but it sounds like we have your parents to thank for the, the original setting or the frame story, uh, and they're thanked in the, the very beginning, which I thought was very moving, uh, in memory of my parents, Alma and Clarence Vanderhag, who weathered 15 years of drought, depression, and war without surrendering to despair or losing sight of what really matters. Um, but the story, the frame story, that is the, the posse of enlisted World War I veterans going after a rogue actor in rural prairie, uh, rural prairie community has its basis in the historical record. Uh, could you talk about that story and, and how your parents uh, might have brought that story to us? Well, um, I was sort of carrying the, the germ of this, the, this, this novel from probably the time I was about eight years old. Because I remember being taken to the RCMP Museum in Regina when I was about that age. And I don't think museums any longer would have such a gory display. <laughs> but part of the display was, a, was an RCMP Stetson that had been crushed by hammer blows. And he, the man who had been murdered, the RCMP officer who had been murdered, had been murdered in my hometown almost exactly at the same time as I set this novel, uh, 1939, on the brink of war. Um, and at that time, there was, there was and, and this is where, of course, the novel sort of departs from right. exact, exact yeah, things. Yeah, there, was, there was one... RCMP officer in town. So what happened was is that a bunch of World War veterans armed themselves and went after this guy. Um, and by the time they sort of ran him to, to ground um, and surrounded him, he was in a, in a wood, wooded area, the RCMP had arrived from, from Yorkton and, and he committed suicide. Uh, but I I was thinking, okay, like, you know, here is, here's a kind of curious thing. My uncle was this, the, the murderer's best friend when they were very young, when they were very young, young children, up until the time they were about 11 years old. Wow. And the RCMP officer's widow was my aunt's best friend. So I, I, I kind of, this was all this story, this big event in a tiny town was always kind of floating around in my head. And I kept on thinking, well, you know, there, there might be something that I can do with this. The other thing was, is that the murderer was like the character in my novel, Ernie Sickert. He was breaking into houses, though he wasn't doing it in such a bizarre way that it, as, as the character in the novel does. And even though his parents were not as obviously more wealthy than 
than than everybody else in the town they were kind of like the upper crust right. you know his sister was married to the you know the local doctor you know they, they were they were english immigrants at a time when that had a certain cachet their house was a little bit bigger than everybody else's house and 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 the fact that they had a, that they had produced a murderer in the family right. actually kind of turned his parents into recluses after that but anyway th this is this this one incident though it's changed vastly and in, in 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 the novel and embellished and and blown up had had its roots in something that had actually happened in in my hometown right so at the heart of that of the story is ernie sickert who is the the murderer at the center of the story 21 year old he's a heck of a saxophone player uh he's a crack marksman uh, keen reader, uh, cunning reader of people and their vulnerabilities, I think I would say. Uh, but he's also a monstrous sociopathic uh, personality in the book. Did the real killer that you were just mentioning, uh, was that a creation for Ernie? Or did you create something completely unique and new to inform Ernie, this fascinating character? I, I Well, I, I created the character Ernie Sickard. The most I ever heard about the original was that people would say he was odd. Right. right? <laughs> which, which isn't very much to go on. Odd in what way? <laughs> odd to what degree? Right. How odd are we talking about? <laughs> we're talking about Ernie Sickard. We're talking superlatively odd. Right. You know, he's he's he he is he is uh, as my father would have said, a piece of work um and and so that was the character that that i wrestled with for a long time but i also what i wanted in in the novel because with you know the the, the evil of of say nazism or or any of the other evils that are that are are brewing underneath the surface of the novel I wanted a recognition that that um, evil is also personal, right? That evil evil can be in, intimate. It's it's not an abstraction. Now, of course, I suppose we know that, uh, and sometimes we know that from our own experience. Uh, but we, I think, we do have a tendency in society to talk about evil as abstraction. And of course, it is an abstraction too. There are, you know, there there are evil evil forces at play, but there are also evil individuals at play. So I want I wanted to produce a monster. Mm -hmm. um, so what, one of the things I find so fascinating about Ernie too is the description of this. And you're describing the abstraction of evil and bringing it into the 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 personal. There's this element, and it's called the thing that's inside him. Uh, this almost creaturely form of life that pushes upward uh, and almost has a kind of an erotic quality for him that pushes him towards violence. Uh, there's a kind of a horror element to the thing. I'm even like a John Carpenter type <laughs> thing that's going on. Uh, where did you find the inspiration to have this visceral thing rolling around in Ernie that almost gives us something to touch uh, inside? Uh, I'm like... Uh, um intuition right i uh, i mean the, you know one one of the things is that psychology often manifests itself in in physical forms right and we we all know that 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 you know if, if we suffer from anxiety or god knows anything else they'll often take on a physical manifestation yeah so with with ernie this is the manifestation. It's this pressure in him, and and he he has to he has to make that pressure concrete. He needs he needs a sort of explanation for for his irrational behavior. And at the end of the novel, I don't think that that I'm giving too much away, but but when when Ernie succumbs, he 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 realizes 
as he puts it, that who this thing was wanted, right? Because the thing inside him wants him to kill certain people, right? Mm -hmm. The thing inside him, what it always really wanted was him. Mm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So again, it's, it's, um, I think at least the realistic novel in, in quotation marks, but the tradition of realism in the novel uh, relies on that kind of intimacy and relies on that kind of detail. And what it attempts to do, I think, is make people feel. Um, now, nobody's going to feel, or, 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 or maybe very few people will feel, I don't know, what Ernie feels about the thing. But for him, it's real, right? Mm. And, and it, it somehow it needs to be mastered, but it, it also masters him. So there is this, this tension in his being. Like one of the things that, that he does before he goes on a murder spree is everybody in this little town, they're, they're perplexed and kind of amused by, by his, his oddness because he runs everywhere. <laughs> Yeah. He runs frantically. Yeah. No matter what he's doing, he's going to the post office, he runs. But he has this feeling like that by running and, and working so very hard, he's depriving the thing inside him of, for lack of a better word, nourishment. He's, he's burning off his excess energy, which feeds the thing inside him. But he can, like, you know, he, he can feel it. When he presses his fingers to his abdomen, it's for him. It's there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I, as I was uh, looking at some of the remarks you've made about the book too, there's a, and it goes back to some of your remarks about the obliqueness of addressing the present within the historical. But there was a particular figure that you had in mind <laughs> when you, <laughs> dare I ask you to to address one of the figures that you had in mind when you were styling Ernie Sickard. Well, again, I, I, you know, when I, when I was when I was writing writing Sickert, I don't think I was really aware of what I was doing when I did it. But he he shook, displays many of Trump's features. Right. You know, a, a kind of unrepentant, insatiable narcissism, coupled with a feeling that everybody is doing him wrong. Yeah. No matter what horrible thing Ernie does he still feels as if, as if he's the pers persecuted. Um, so in my mind, there was something Trump-like about, about, about Ernie's monstrous ego, but also like uh, how easily he could change depending on what the circumstances are. Um, I mean, I think Trump famously uh, has no principles. Right, he, he he doesn't actually seem to have any any any. There are no rails for him, and in that way, he's sort of like Ernie. I mean, the only thing that Ernie cares about is Ernie, <laughs> and, yeah. and and he will do anything he's that that he wishes um, or hopes to to you know to satisfy his ego. So, and, and again, it's like this, this, I think the weird thing that happens, at least with me when I'm writing fiction, it, I, I never said to myself, I'm going to write a Trump-like character. But having watched Trump for four years or even longer, I mean, even in the pre-election period, I think somehow he seeped into my subconscious. And so when I sat down to write Ernie Sickert, Ernie Sickert became something like Donald Trump. Yeah. When the thing inside, and he's a fascinating character. I mean, just alone, I, everybody watching out there, I recommend the book just for the, the haunting uh, presence of Ernie. He's such a unique character um, and you've done just such a um, yeah, haunting job of, of sketching him. Once that thing emerges inside Ernie and he attempts to flee after committing some unspeakable acts of violence, we meet the two brothers, um, Jack and Oliver Dill, uh, veterans of World War I, um, who would be 
that frame story of the chase that uh, you grew up with. In the description of Oliver Dill, the narrator remarks that he's crippled by experience. Um, and this is a remark alongside of his wife, Judith, a description that also captures Jack, who is damaged in his own unique way. Um, as the threat of war looms, 1939, the novel has dispatches too from the Winnipeg Tribune that gives us always a sense of where we are in the world. Jack and Oliver bear witness to the traumas of war that linger on. Um, how has the war crippled the brothers with experience? They both seem to have their own unique uh, crutches in the aftermath. Yeah, I, I think it's the, the way that Jack is crippled uh, is more obvious because J Jack went into the war with a certain, a certain religious conviction. He has a he has a mystical experience in the war that, I mean, it could easily be read as the product of shell shock, mm -hmm. uh, where 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 he 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 arrives at his own strange personal religion, and this strange personal re uh, religion is the reconciliation of heaven with earth. In one way, I think that that was the experience of of of, of a lot of veterans of of war mm. is that when they return to a peacetime world how do you reconcile the horrors of war particularly in the first world war which was in in many ways you know one of the most visceral uh, bloody uh, uh horrendous wars ever not that that any war ever escapes that um so so jack Jack is trying to find find his way to some sort of reconciliation with with, with the world. Oliver is is um, I, I think he takes a, a different route, and with with Oliver, there's a kind of cynicism about 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 him, a hardness about him. Um, a kind of violence, which, which is also accentuated by the, by the death of his wife, which he feels in some ways that he's had a hand in that, mm. um, and and one of the one of the things about about Oliver, he he surprises the the the, the woman who who he has a, a relationship with. Uh, is she surprised at at how 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 much he's up on the news? Mm. Because he he showed no sign of that whatsoever. But part of his cynicism is is that when war breaks out, he says, "I'm never going to read a piece of of news because it's all lies." Yeah. And yeah. and I I went I went I went I went through the First World War, and I don't want to risk succumbing to lies, the way the the, the way the people on the home front did during the First World War. I, I think in some ways, um, Oliver all, all, Oliver is is the hard headed realist, right? Uh, he's kind of like the Harry Truman, right, <laughs> of, of of the two brothers. Where, where's, where's, where's Jack? Is a yearner. Yeah, you know, he yearns for the world to be better. He wants the world to be better. Um, and I, I, I think people who go through traumatic experiences may go in many, many directions, but two of the possible ones are a kind of hard-headed realism, practicality, cynicism. To, and I, I think that description shorthands who Oliver is too much. Right. Uh, or they, 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 they go into a hope that the world, that the, that, that the that the world behind behind the appearances of the world that there's something transcendent you know which i think is is one of the attractions and 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 the motives behind religious faith of uh, faith 
despite what we see every day, there's something better there. Right. That there, that there is something th that there's an essential goodness that transcends what what evidence may show us. Right, and there is a real strong sense of hope that runs through the the novel and reconciliation with so many of these forces that are combating. Um, but you do see the brothers translated in a certain way. They they come back different men, and you can think with Oliver, um, who was a jumper who's hot tempered and hot blooded. But when he comes back, I think the phrase is fury was winter to all of the dill. So it becomes winterized in his years that he comes back. I think you describe it as the first ice age. And he begins to thaw when he meets Judith. Um, and later on, when he meets Ernie, he has a great glacier of anger that was grinding the bedrock of his being. And you can feel these, the metaphors of, of the environment kind of coming in, which really links us into another element of the book that I really admire and loved, is this synchronicity between the characters and the storms inside them, the storm that's looming with the, the war on the horizon, the literal storms, uh, August into winter. We begin with this massive August a uh, storm that locks everything down, and then we end with this blizzard. Would it would it be fair to say that the weather, and of course, the landscape too, is a character in this book, or that it comes to the fore in that way? I, I think so. Um, uh, I mean, one of the things that that among the the the, the writers that I admire. Um, what they're capable of doing is, is that, they're, that they're capable of using the external world to, to evoke or invoke the internal world of the characters. Yeah. Um, so I think that, that again, when, when I started the novel, I knew it was going to open with a storm because it was very close to the beginning and I knew what I was going to sit down and write. Right. But I had no sense it would end with a storm. Interesting. Yeah. But when I came to, to, when I was approaching the end of the novel, I felt this is what is necessary for these characters at this point in time. It's another storm and a storm with a different character and with a different outcome. Um, so... There might have been a premonition of that when I first started to, to write the novel. I don't know. I'm pretty sure that I had no map. Right. I mean, when I when I start a novel, I only have a very, very general idea about what direction it's going, going to go in. And so I tend to throw throw my characters into situations and then see what what they'll do given the people that they are. So if you put Jack Dill, in 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 certain circumstances, he's going to behave differently than his brother, or Vidalia, or Ernie Sickert. Right. Um, so I I I, I kind of chase my own nose when I'm writing a novel. Yeah, and I think you use this phrase, and I love this phrase as well: the happy accidents when you're writing. That the happy accidents come along, and that's the adventure of writing the process. Was it sounds like this one would have been one of those happy accidents to discover the the storm that would would culminate. Yeah, well, I I, I don't want to give too too much yeah, absolutely no no too much away about the novel. <laughs> yeah, but the handcuffs were a ha happy accident. Ah, well, I I think that that's good. And that's that's not giving away, but that's that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I had to go back and write the handcuffs into the earlier, the earlier chapter because I felt the moment needed, <laughs> needed handcuffs at the end, you know? So, I mean, I've written short stories, right? Where um, I've worked back from the ending of the story. I remember once that, you know, when I was in that liminal area where you're just drifting off to sleep, I, I mean, Something popped into my head and I saw a man standing in a dark street singing to a house that had lights on. I didn't know what he was singing, 
But then I went and I wrote a short story that would get him to the house in the street singing, right? So that image was a happy accident. I was given the image. And for me, I found the image really intriguing because it, for me, it raised all sorts of questions. Why is he singing? Who or what is in the house that he's singing to? Why is, why is it night rather than day? All of these other sorts of things. And so to answer the questions that the image produced for me, I had to write answers into a story. Right. And it, it strikes me, I, I'm one of the, when you were here the last time at the Words Festival, you used uh, to describe your writing process this way, you turned to hockey parlance and you <laughs> described yourself as the grinder. <laughs> and I loved that image of the grinder because it is talent, but it's also the hard work of getting into the archive and getting into the, uh, the historical um, record to texturize. And I imagine too in this book that it must have taken a long time to inhabit the feel of the landscape, but also the story to get the language, uh, to find Ernie's almost unique language. Was that the case for, for this, this book as well? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I think people who don't write actually have no sort of idea about like how much hard work it is <laughs> and, and, and how it's just sort of grinding. <laughs> sort of anecdotally, uh, I, 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 maybe I'm revealing way too much about, about <laughs> myself, but. More and more. I, no, no, <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, I played golf in a senior men's league. Yeah. And, and virtually none of those people have any interest in the world that I inhabit whatsoever. They can't figure out why it would take anybody as long to write a book as it takes me. Because if you have a 300 page book, surely you can write two pages a day, right? So in half a year, you should be able to finish a novel, right? In, in their mind, it's like, it's just that simple. Right. You, it's, you just sort of sit down and write. Right. And, and you know, like, I taught creative writing for a long time. And one of the things that, that I used to hammer away in, incessantly at my students is that beginning writers tend to give up too soon. And what they think is what they lack is inspiration, mm -hmm. right? Because things aren't falling into place. And I say, no, what you lack is doggedness, right? That, that of course your intuition as a writer or your talent as a writer or your imagination as, as a writer is essential, mm. right? But at the same time, any writer I believe will, will, will come to a point in a novel where it turns into problem solving. Mm. Yeah. What's, what's the matter here? Why isn't this working? And how do I fix it? Um, and I, th I think a lot of beginning writers or younger writers, they run into a problem and they say, oh, you know, I, this was a bad idea, right? I shouldn't, I should never have started that. I shouldn't have gone down this path. When really, they sometimes have to say to themselves, I'm going to sacrifice something that I sweated over. Right for a long time because it's not working. And I would, I, you know, I, I told my students, like I would throw it 150 pages of a novel. Wow. Right? You know, because even though I may have spent a long time writing that, it has to be sacrificed if it's not doing what it needs to do in the novel. Yeah. You know, you, 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 you have to say, <clears throat> what you have to say is that you're serving the book, whatever book you're writing. Um, and that you, you, you sometimes, in a sense, you have to sacrifice work that you've done, even though you hate to turn your back on it or put it in a drawer 
or say it has to be cut, that's a really hard thing to do, right? Mm. To, to actually just say, this is not working. And I, I spent three months writing something that's not working and I'm going to have to toss it and go back and, and do it a different way. And that might be, you know, th that might be something as simple as, as writing something in the first person when you discover that you actually need to write it in the third person. Right. Right. Or finding the, the handcuffs and then yeah. finding yeah. a way to stitch it back through. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Doggedness. I, one more character I'd like to talk about, and then I, I would love to turn to questions from the audience. Uh, if anybody has any, so put them in. Um, and we'd love to bring them over to Guy as well. Um, Videlia, I, I have to ask about um, Videlia. Um, one of the most compelling characters, uh, um, she is a proto-feminist. She is, talk about doggedness. She's dealt a difficult hand as it were, but she's fiercely independent at a time when it was very challenging uh, to be so. Could you tell us about Videlia? Um, I believe she's also, a character that might illustrate how uh, writers bring their own personal uh, life into a character as well. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I, I've said elsewhere that in some ways, she's a bit modeled on my mother. <laughs> my, my, my mother was a sergeant major in the Canadian Women's Army Corps during the Second World War. And I can testify she was a sergeant major at home. And she was no pushover <laughs> for anyone, right? So I, I grew up, I think, with that as a sort of model. Um, maybe I'm like one of those ducks, ducklings that, or, or goslings that get imprinted early. And, and so I carried that around in my head. Um, so she's a strong woman. That doesn't mean she's not a conflicted woman. Right. That that doesn't mean that she's she's not a, she's not a woman who makes her own fair share of mistakes. Uh, but in some ways, uh, she, you know, my grandmother, my mother, uh, my aunts they they were they were um, um, they were. They were, they, were, they were women who knew their own mind. Now, they couldn't necessarily triumph over the, you know, the, the, the norms of the society in which they lived in. When, when I was a little kid, which will, you know, maybe speak to the self-centeredness of children or maybe just my own self-centeredness, uh, I remember my mother saying one time, that she'd never been happier than when she was in the army. Right. And I kind of thought, well, wait, how, you know, mm. I wasn't on the scene then. Right. You know, like, right. And it's a surprising thing to, to think, because we would associate the experience of the army as being traumatized. Yeah. yeah. But for her, it was she had she had all kinds of 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 opportunities and and a kind of authority. That came with rank, right? Um, I mean, one of the things that she did was that she was she she trained men who had had um, suffered sort of severe injuries in the war that that meant that they couldn't do the jobs that they had done before the war. So she was training them in clerical work, but she outranked many of them. So theoretically, at least, they have to listen to her, <laughs> you know, and, and, and just the sort of general, free, like she, she, she talked about the freedom that a uniform gave you. She came from a poor family, right? But she said, in a uniform, you could go anywhere. You know, she said, I could go into the bar in the Waldorf Astoria in a uniform. Right. Because my mother also played basketball on the Canadian women's army basketball team, and they wow. used to go down, go, like go down to the states to to you know do do morale building games against American teams and stuff like that. But for her, you know the the you know the 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 years in the army 
you know, they gave her an opportunity to do things that she would never, never have had except in those particular circumstances. And I, I think most of us are aware of like women who were who were urged to work out of the home during the war to fill jobs that men had had done, and then they were they were expected to go back to doing what they had done before the war, you know, they'd theoretically be a homemaker, be a wife, be a mother, all the rest of it. I think there were a lot of women who didn't want to do that. And I think my mother was one of them. <laughs> she always worked out of the home. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I didn't, I don't think she wanted that, that, that role. And I think she, I think she resented it. Absolutely. And I, I should acknowledge LM Little, who's in the questions, who had asked uh, to talk about Vidalia. Uh, so that that was an, ex uh, we picked that up um, along the way. And I, I want to acknowledge a couple of the comments here. One from Margaret Lonsdale that says, doggedness, I'm writing that down, sticking it to the wall. <laughs> and uh, Lorinda Shepherd, I told my students today that doggedness is better than determined. So uh, I think what you've remarked in terms of that approach is resonating with folks who are watching right now. I, it strikes me when you're talking about your mom that this novel really is so much of a, almost a love letter to your parents, that there's a real that it must have been your parents who you had on your mind when you were writing this particular book, front to cover. Yeah, you know, like Tom Brokaw and other people had, you know, re remarked on on what that generation of people went through. Right. Um, and they also did it, I think, more or less gracefully. They generalities are always dangerous right but I, I don't think that 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 they ever in reflecting on that i don't think there was ever a lot of whining about it they acknowledged that it was hard they acknowledged that 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 in many ways that they were that they were in in a sense really marked by what they went through um but I also think my mother used to tell me stories. She came from a very large family and, and, and they were poor. But she'd tell me stories about my grandmother who would send the kids down to the railway tracks with sandwiches to give to the men who were riding the rails. They didn't have a lot, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I don't think that my grandmother could have ever turned anybody away from the door who was hungry, as long as there was something to give them. Um, that, that was almost a reflex. That wasn't something I, I think that they had to think about. Um, they did it. So I'm, I'm a, I belong to the generation of like, don't trust anybody over the age of 30. <laughs> yeah. Even then, even then, I mostly trusted people over the age of thirty, <laughs> as opposed to my own generation. I, I, you know, they weren't they weren't perfect, but but you know, the, the word dogged could apply to many of them. I mean, they they dealt with a lot, and and they did it with a certain not just resignation, but 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 they lived their lives, I think, given the material circumstances and everything that they had to face, uh, with a certain grace. I mean, Hemingway's phrase, grace under pressure, he used it in particular circumstances, but I, I think that they showed grace under pressure. Right, and it, it strikes me too, the way that you're thinking about your parents' generation and those uh, the that greatest generation uh, dealt with war, dealt with um, uh, some of the forces that we can see looming on the horizon that you spoke about right at the beginning of uh, the worry that you have. And it strikes me that um, in thinking about your parents, you're almost casting a warning to to future generations, to the current generation of what might be on the horizon. Do you think the historical novel can give us uh, a perspective on something that maybe we've lost sight of 
uh, as a cautionary way, the complexity, but also just the forces that that are in history that we can learn from in the present. I would hope so. You know, I'm I'm in in one way I'm I'm very leery of didactic literature. Right. Right. Um, and I'm I'm leery of the idea of of people being taught something right by a book i'm not leery of the idea about people learning something from a book which is that they draw the implications out of what they read mm -hmm. um i i think that 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 we you know when you when you face the question of, of democracy I think a lot of Western societies thought of it as a given. Yeah. It, it was this, that it was a fact and that, that nothing would change that fact. I think there are a lot of forces out there that want to change democracy as a fact. Um, and I think that that uh, I think the problem with people in the middle, which is what I, what I would call myself, right. is that we haven't been very resolute or very vociferous about protecting our democracy and our freedoms. Um, and in that way, we resemble many many people who were were advocates of of liberal democracy in the 1930s and 1920s i think that the weimar republic failed for some of the the, the same reasons that american democracy and american government seems to be stumbling through right now um you know an inability to pass any sorts of legislation, um, a focus on oppositional politics, yeah. uh, a demonization of of uh, um, the opponent, a lack of de decorum. I mean, just sort of simple decency in in public um, discussions, and an unwillingness to engage with with the media right which, which is like an unwillingness to to attempt to even attempt to answer hard questions you know politicians always dodged hard questions but now speaking points it, it, it it's like it's stunning how right. anyone how any journalist can go into a press conference and ask a question <laughs> that they know is not going to be answered yeah. and will yeah. not be answered. Yeah. Yeah, and, and those are the those are the checks. Those are the the systems that were put in place when we designed these systems. And when they start to fail so spectacularly, it becomes worrisome. I have a question here from an anonymous attendee um, and uh, quite relevant to, to right now. Jack's religious allusions and treatise was quite extensive in the book. Like Ernie Sickert is Trump-like, what is the significance of Jack's spiritual struggles in this work? Oh, that's 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 a good question, but it's a hard one. Yeah. Um, I th I think that one of the things the significant of of uh, of Jack's str struggle is that there is a certain willful bl willful blindedness on his part. Um, maybe I'm too much of a rationalist, but I, th I think that people, it doesn't matter in whatever sort of sphere of belief, whether it's politic, you know, political, religious, philosophical, or anything else, um, they have to ask themselves questions about their beliefs. Jack doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. Now, now, now he's an amiable fanatic. <laughs> yeah. you know? like, all, you know, like Oliver says about him, as long as you keep him off religion, right. you never know he was nuts, right? <laughs> <laughs> or words to that effect. 
Yeah, or go in his room at the Kanad Hotel. Or... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so you know, I would say that's Jack's flaw. Um, but but the thing about, I mean, at least in my mind, in many ways, Jack is the purest soul in right. the novel, in the sense that that Jack would never want to to do anyone any harm except to save someone. Yeah. Right. And, and yet during the war, um, the scenes of the going behind the lines, those are also some of the most unsettling uh, and drawn so spectacular with such visceral quality. Uh, I see another question in the, in, that I, I really like, uh, and I think this one's quite quite good. And it brings in Loretta, who we haven't had a chance to talk about. So this is even better here. Do you see Loretta and Ernie as parallel ca characters? That is both psychopaths. There's there's a little mischief in in Miss Loretta as well. Here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Loretta is is a troubled <laughs> <laughs> a troubled young woman who bring, br br sort of burnt down her parents' house. Um, and and in fact, in many ways, she has the upper hand on Ernie. She's she's the she's the one character who, at least at some level, Ernie defers to. Like, right, not completely, not completely, right. but but uh, he's the one person that Ernie idealizes. She's the one person that that. Yeah. Um, Ernie idealizes. Now, the thing about Loretta is, is that she's probably the most, one of the most sketchily drawn characters in the novel, just because yeah, you, 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 you can't give equal attention to everyone. Right. Uh, but I'm, I, I think that doesn't sort of diminish her importance, at least for Ernie. Absolutely. You know, she's she's sort of she's sort of the lodestar for for Ernie. And it, I think she's one of the things that actually does something to humanize Ernie. Right. I mean, it's it's it's. It's a very weird relationship. I mean, there's there's no other way to describe it. Extraordinarily we weird re relationship, but it's also a relationship that's struck between Two damaged people who are also outsiders. Yeah, and of course we see that happening in life all the time. That 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 people who are shunned or who feel that they don't don't belong, um, that they they are magnets for one another, and that's that's the the case with Ernie and Loretta. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Terry Caruso has a question. You mentioned your mom told you stories of the war. Do you think women were more able to talk of their war experiences rather than men? Yeah, because the quality of their war experience was different. I mean, at that point in time, there were very, very few women who who were anywhere close to combat. Um, you know, they were drivers, they were clerical staff, they were, you know, they, they did all sorts of things. Um, my uncles, some of whom were wounded, wounded in the Second World War, they, I never heard any of them talk about battle, but they talked about what, what they got up to, mm -hmm. like when they were on leave. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, th that sort of thing. I think I'm not, I mean, one of the things that, 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 you know, the sort of band of brothers mythology, you know, talking about the comradeship of battle, I mean, it's really, really weird. But I also think that my mother had some of that same comradeship of, of women. Interesting. Uh, in service. And and the way that you know they they talked about what they did and 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 the, the, the friends they made and even you know at a time when when people didn't travel as easily as they do now you know my my mother uh, I'm sure that she, I bet you she was 
never outside of Saskatchewan until the Second World War. Wow. And then, you know, not only did she get to other parts of Canada, like Quebec and Ontario, but she met women from all over Canada. And she met women who had very, very different social backgrounds um, than, than she would have encountered um, where she grew up. I, I think it was, I think in many ways, it was sort of equally important to, to uh, both genders. Uh, but but I, but I think the quality of the experience may have been different. Right. It's interesting too because Vidalia is associated in many ways with Winnipeg, and Winnipeg at this time in the novel is kind of the big city, and you have Dill who's in Kennet, uh, and there's almost a way in which you're bridging divides between the rural and the urban and you can see in that first date she's in the the car and has a migraine and she's smelling the farm on him etc was that something that you were aware or you were thinking of too of of how and of course if anybody was watching the the u.s election yesterday this question of, of rural to urban is still so much a part of the divisions in our in our social political and cultural life was that something you were thinking of yeah i mean okay this again i think that i'm sort of replaying the mythologies of my childhood yeah. because i grew up in the eastern side of saskatchewan so our big city was winnipeg yeah and that's where people went to like buy a car or um, ship cattle or anything else but also part of like the mythology of my my, my growing up the way I did was that rural kids, small town kids always had a chip on their shoulder when, when they, when they ran into big city kids. <laughs> I think that's still the case. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, you know, and, and it mightn't have been anybody else's definition of, of, of big city, but, if, like me, you went to a small town school and you went to university, as I did, you know, in Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan, I, I very quickly discovered that kids who went to city high schools had a way different education than I did. And comparatively, they seemed really sophisticated, mm. right? Mm. They, they had had high school programs that you know I never had there the the we were reading we were reading in literature classes we were reading books that were already like 50 years old right and they were reading in high schools like books I'd never heard of which were relatively contemporary right um and you know and and it's it's kind of understandable that anyone would do that. Uh, they, they ran into a guy like like me. I was a hick, right? I dressed like a hick. I talked like a hick, mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly hadn't had the same experience as they had. So, you know, there is often Vidalia is actually quite condescending. Yeah, yeah. Right? You know, because she's a city girl. I mean, she's from Winnipeg, um, and she's grown up in a in a in a city which, at that time, was like one of the most diverse cities in Canada. Yep. Um, large Jewish community, you know, large Eastern European uh, community, Italians. My grandfather was a Belgian, and there was a big Belgian community in in Saint Boniface. Yeah. Um, so. You know, it, yeah, th th there's that tension there. And, th and that tension, I think, also manifests itself in politics. Um, whether it's United States or Canada, there, there is a divide. And, and even in this country between West and East. Yeah. You know, b b between, between um, more conservative areas of the country and, and more progressive or liberal areas of the country. And when I say liberal, I'm talking about a small L. Uh, liberal. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Nancy Gale has a question. Uh, and she starts off, uh, in, 
Comments, I would very much agree with. Guy, just wonderful writing and comments. Uh, my question is about the emotion you engage with readers, listeners of your characters. In your books, in a few pages, we are invested in your characters and they evoke a real reaction. How do you draw right characters that are not historical characters, but fully formed humans that we can care about so quickly in your novels? What do you work to get right about each character uh, in this wonderful book, but also another example is in Daddy Lennon, the title short story. Well, that's a very that's a very flattering question. So so thank you. Uh, I mean, one of the things I think, and I, I used to tell creative writing students is don't write a character from the outside, write the character from the inside, mm. which is a bit like method acting. Uh, you know, a, a method a method actor attempts to inhabit the character that that they're that they're portraying. And I try and write even character every character, even if it's a a reprehensible, di disagreeable character like Ernie, right. I try to write him from the inside. I try to say, what would I think if I were Ernie Sickert? Or what would I think or what would I feel? Maybe more importantly, what would I feel if I were any other character? That I think that requires, in, in, to a certain extent, suspending your own disbelief. Right. Um, there's another phrase I used to throw at creative writing students, write with stupid confidence. <laughs> I like and, it. Yeah, so <laughs> my stupid confidence is that I assume I can do it. Right? And if I assume I can do it, and I turn turn the censoring part of my brain off, and then just try to do it. I think that that helps me create, uh, come closer to creating uh, fully fleshed three dimensional characters. Um, I think if you look at the outside of a character and and don't um, and don't really focus on the emotions of the character um and and actually try and put yourself in the character's shoes right that for me that's 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 how you 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 arrive at at well a believable character right uh i like margaret lonsdale's comment guy please hold steady to your stupid confidence <laughs> Well, I do. <laughs> the older I get, the stupider I get. So, you know, maybe, <laughs> but maybe it's, it'll work for me. It's interesting, too, because the way that it goes back to this, and I love this word, and it might be one of the words that I take from, is this obliqueness and the way it, it, you have to touch the historical record. And if you go too strongly towards, and you use the figures of Churchill or somebody like that, you have the constraints of people really knowing that character. But if you can find an oblique way in, you have a you have a different angle, and you have a multi-perspectival potential to take on something that somebody might think I know already everything to know about this subject. And the, and the thing is, is that you can't overcome what people already know. Yeah, but Gore, Gore Vidal was a spectacular historical novelist, but his most successful work was Burr because nobody knew too much about Aaron Burr. Right. Okay. So he could write Burr and and everybody's saying, no, no, that's wrong, that's wrong, etc. His his novel about Lincoln, there was nothing in it that was in quotation marks historically wrong. Okay. But the resistance he had to overcome on the part of the pop public was huge. Mm -hmm. Right, because they already thought they knew they knew Lincoln, and he was contradicting what they, in quotation marks, knew. So, I, I think it's often the characters who seem swept up in events, rather than the characters like Tolstoy's, you know, business about 
about historical figures who think they're guiding events but aren't. Right. I think the historical novel works best with with characters that that uh, the public doesn't know very much about, which I would argue that's why Hilary Mantel was so successful with an important historical character, mm. but a character that the public didn't know very much about. Right, right. Absolutely. And, you know, and the other thing, too, is you think about Aaron Burr, um, Gore Vidal, but also Lin-Manuel Miranda. <laughs> now everybody yeah, Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it reanimates and has that potential now to think of the entire founding fathers of the United States in the form of a hip hop. Uh, <laughs> spectacular. Well, like uh, Alexander Hamilton's in the same position. Right. right? Every, every, everybody, you know, with 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 that musical, everybody knows a tiny bit about Alexander Hamilton. But the musical says he was this and he was this and he was this and he was that. And everybody goes, wow, right? Yeah. I don't think, I don't think that you could make, say, a musical about, I don't know, again, Lincoln work because he's such an iconic figure and so much is known about him yeah, even, absolutely. even even among people who who don't read history or or whatever they retain um is it's maybe pretty minimal but it's enough for to for, to, to make it difficult to contradict what people already have some sort of assurance that they know they may not know it, but they feel they know it. Absolutely. We're getting close to time. If anybody does have any questions, please do throw them into the chat and I'll try and uh, bring them before we have before we end. Um, one of the questions that I've, I've been asking, and we talked a little bit about this before we came live to air, and I, I find it fascinating to hear uh, from, from writers and people who are creative right now, is to talk about how you spent your time during the pandemic. Was it a time that for you was was creative? Was it something that was anxiety? How, how was the experience of being uh, locked down and, and isolated for you as, as a writer guy? Yeah, I mean, I think at first, like most people, I was paralyzed. And the other thing is, is that I sometimes think that I got off easy because unlike people who, who kind of moved in a milieu in which it was essential that they interact with other people, yeah. I didn't have that problem. Um, all the same, I mean, I, I finished this book during that time and I did some other kind of like nonfiction writing, not even for an eye towards an eye a publication, but just because there were things that I thought that I wanted to write about. I got by uh, I didn't have an explosion of creativity. I mean, some of my friends who weren't like necessarily writers uh, seem to get a lot of work done. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think I think I was moderately successful. <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I wasn't stupendous, but but we have uh, this. We yes. have this. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, is like I think you know, given my age, I think I'm also slowing down um that you know my capacity for work might might not be what it used to be uh i don't think anybody had a good pandemic uh but i think i might have had an easier pandemic than a lot of people yeah um somebody has asked what's currently on your bedside table what are you reading right now um you immediately instinctively turned over there to find no, out. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking because I've always got like three or four things going. I'm actually reading Cormac McCarthy's The Passenger right now, ah. uh, which has just come out. Um, and I, I like I always do a lot of rereading of of books, and particularly during the pandemic, I I, I did a lot of that. So, you know. Um, I'm reading Faulkner's Absalom. Absalom. Uh, I read a fair amount of nonfiction. Um, 
So I'm reading a biography of Vasily Grossman, the, the Russian novelist um, who wrote two great novels about the Second World War. Um, but you know that's that's basically what I'm what I'm fastened down with right now. Wonderful. Uh, L. M. Little wants to know uh, what you're working on right now. Is that something that would be fair to ask at this? The, the, the most I can say is I've I've made a stab at starting a novel. I'm, I'm just barely into it. I have no idea where it'll go. Um, I'm you know. Since I don't know where I'm going, I can't even, you know, at this point, say what it's going to be about or or what I hope it will be about. Right. But there's there's something there's we all have our fingers crossed um, and that that confidence that you were describing about uh, before. Um, absolutely. That's terrific. Uh, we I, when we were coming on, you'd mentioned that over the the pandemic, you've also been an, a very astute observer of what's happening in the world. And of course, I know I, I didn't say I was an astute observer. <laughs> an observer, nonetheless. <laughs> we an, could obsessed, modify it. An, an obsessed observer. An obsessed. That's right. You did say obsessed. You did say obsessed. Now we had this this massive event uh, yesterday that I think some people thought was a, de a referendum on democracy. And we started off the conversation today by um, thinking about presentments and how the historical novel allows us to, in some way, look at the window to the present. Um, after what, what's taken place, how do you feel? Do you feel uh, similarly um, uh, anxious? What, has this had any impact on your mood, what, what unfolded last night? Well, I, I think it's more kind of like come see, come saw. Um, it wasn't as disastrous as I thought it might be. But I think the jury's still out. Yeah. And when I say that, I'm 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 not. I think the jury is still out all over the world. Um, what has happened in Italy? What has happened in Sweden? What has happened in Poland and Hungary? Um, certain movements within our own country, which I I'm I'm disturbed about. Uh, I hope to God that that we are resilient enough to to come to our senses. Uh, but I think it's going to take an effort, and it's going to take an effort on everyone's part um, to to uh, to hold on to what we've got. And I, I think we've been too cavalier about it, and that that goes that goes for everyone. And I think that our politicians have been too cavalier about it, um, that they thought that, that, um, that they could toy with democracy uh, and that they could toy with, with uh, playing the game of democracy. Mm -hmm. That is like, how do you get elected? What do you need to do to get elected? Rather than, than saying that actually democracy involves certain principles. And sure, you know, there's an electoral game that, that every political party has to play to a certain extent, but the game has gotten more important than the reasons for, for, for wanting to win the game. And, you know, I, I, I have a feeling that there's too much, of, too much a sense out there of, of, that people are pursuing power for power's sake, rather than saying, if I do achieve power, I want to do this with it. Um, but you know, I've always been a kind of half glass full guy, <laughs> you know. So I don't know. Maybe I'm chicken little. Um, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. But but I'm worried, and I I I think we should all be worried. Absolutely. Um... I can't thank you enough for the generosity of your responses, for taking us into such personal questions. One of the things I realized as we were chatting tonight was just how personal a novel this is and how important that dedication to your parents at the beginning of this book is, because I can see now talking to you just how much this is informed by your experience and by your reflections of your parents as well. 
Uh, I love the advice that you gave to writers of pursue writing with doggedness and with stupid confidence. I think we should all take that into our lives. I think everybody who came... Not, not too stupid. Not, not too stupid. stupid. <laughs> Moderated stupid confidence right, with, right. A, with a balanced... <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I thank you, everybody who asked a question tonight. I tried to get as many as possible. I see a question about whether the interview will be available. We have recorded it. And with Guy's permission, we can share uh, the, the interview uh, at a future time. And we can do that on the festival's website. The book is August into Winter. I picked this up last, I said this to Guy, last uh, winter break. And I read it while I was with my family over the pandemic. Uh, and I loved it. And I recommend this book so highly to every single person who's tuned in tonight. Buy it for gifts. It's a great gift to read over over the coming holiday. Guy Vanderhag, thank you so much for being with us tonight. This has just been such an exceptional opportunity to welcome you back virtually to London's Words Festival. Well, I'm I'm very I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity, and and thank you for. Um, your questions, which were probably better than the answers, but but uh, I enjoyed myself and and uh, it was good to to sort of almost see you in person once again. <laughs> yes, and and for a future occasion, uh, I hope very soon we'll be able to do that. Um, stay safe to you and to everybody around you and to everybody at home who's watching. Um, stay tuned for more words events that are coming up and check out our website. Thank you so much, Guy. We really appreciate this. Thank you, Josh.